Well, good afternoon and welcome to MedTech Crossroads. I'm Gene Paranak and today is our 32nd episode. It's Friday, October 23rd. If you're anywhere near Southeast Michigan, you know it's a balmy afternoon, but the storms are coming, so glad to be here with you today. My guests today are Allison London Brown of Uvision 360, a novel hysteroscopy company, and Dr. Brent Nowak from AMDI, the Advanced Medical Device uh, Development Institute at uh, Grand Valley State University. So we'll be talking to them each in uh, just a little bit. First, I wanna give you just a few news items. We're going to stop that share and bring up a different one. You all know our friends at MedHealth in Southeast Michigan um, and the many good things that they do for the community. They have recently partnered with Scale Health, which is a national group to bring connections, including uh, investors and other partners to startups in this area. And we're gonna try next week to, um, to have Stacy on to tell us more about that. There is a webinar happening November 5th if you want to learn more about those resources and those partnerships. We wanted to make sure you knew about that. Also, for MedTech Crossroads, uh, we have been updating the website so that the other episodes are all easier to access. We actually had one of our dear friends say that she uses this all the time for her mentoring students. She says, I heard about this on that episode, talking to this founder, this investor, uh, and I want to share that with all my mentoring students. We've heard that from a number of our guests, and so those are all accessible on the website. We're working on better ways to index those, but if there's a session that you remember that had some points made that you want to share with uh, folks, you can find those here at the website at intubing.com slash medtech-crossroads. And with that, those are our news items. I want to welcome to the show uh, my good friend Allison London Brown, who is the uh, founder and CEO of Uvision 360. Welcome, Allison. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you just fine. Right. It's good to have you on MedTech Crossroads. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Allison's a founder. She's a mentor. She's a board member. She's got over 90 product launches under her belt, and she's sort of seen it all. And now, Allison, you're running a novel femtech company. Um, are, you know, arguably in a man's world, you're, you're a female founder running a femtech company doing uh, hysteroscopy. I'd like you to start by telling us more about the product and about the company and what uh, challenges it's solving. So um, for those of you who don't know what hysteroscopy is, um, what we're talking about is um, really endoscopes. So these are scopes that go into the body and they look at a various, um, various organs or they really enable diagnostic and therapeutic procedures. Um, you can maybe think of you know, having a colonoscopy or um, some of these things that people think of. Um, we are focused on um, primarily on women's health, although we are um, recently looking into male urology as well. Um, and our uh, system has, was developed um, specifically for the office environment. And so very low cost, very compact. And we um, focus on the bladder and uh, the uterus. And so to Jean's point, you know, thinking about how in the world do you talk to male investors? I mean, the majority of my investors are men. Um, a large number of my team are men, a large number of my board is men. And so how do you talk about um, the uterus and some of the female parts that can be kind of icky uh, for some um, without, uh, you know, causing embarrassment or causing um, concerns. So um, it's been an interesting journey. Um, and, you know, Gene uh, and I have known each other since the beginning of this, um, and he uh, actually, his, he and his team helped us to design um, our system. So uh, just real quickly, this is what we're talking about. This is the scope. It's very small. Um, it's less than two millimeters in diameter. And um, there's a simple handle and it's all one piece. Uh, the lighting is in here. We have a small processor that um, enables the video processing. And then we have a range of hysteroscopy and cystoscopy sheets. So this is just one of them. It's an operative sheath. And our unique um, value proposition is that we allow one-handed rotation. And so it's, I don't know if you can kind of see that moving around there. Um, but we have um, three sheets that are currently on the market and we have one more that's going to be coming to market, we hope, in uh, first quarter, depending on what the FDA does. Um, and so it's been a lot of fun um, 
creating this with my team. I've got a great team um, and great partners like like Gene and his team. So, so Allison, what are the what are the kinds of hurdles and the kinds of challenges um, that you've run into with a women's health product and specifically in this area? What are what are sort of the unique things? Is this an, is this a place where the market and the regulatory and the funding space is ascending? Is it descending? Are there unique strengths? Are there unique weaknesses? Because I know we've got a lot of a lot of folks who think about women's health. Uh, we know a lot of female co-founders as well. And how? What are what are the challenges? Where are you at an advantage working on a women's health product today? Where maybe is the team at a disadvantage working on a women's yeah. health product today? I would say in general. Um, so I, you know, Jane, as you know, I've had lots of. Um, past experience when failures of startups and many of them have been in women's health. Um, and I would say, you know, starting in about 2013 is when I did my last venture before you vision and couldn't raise anything. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the investment community really wasn't um, ready to talk about women's health again. There had been a lot of lawsuits. Um, my background was at um, Johnson and Johnson and GE and other companies. So spent a lot of time in women's health. Um, but the market just had gone through a period where they really were not interested in, in these kinds of products. And so um, I think when Uvision started in 2016, uh, we were kind of at the right time, the right place. Um, the markets were turning around, certainly from the recession. You had more investors that were interested in things. And for this particular um, company, we were able to talk about the device in terms of its economic value proposition, you know, it's it's cheaper for the office, it's cheaper for the patients, it's cheaper for the payer. So the economic value proposition was very, very strong. Um, and we focused on the technology more than the clinical aspects. And that really, I think, was the difference. Um, plus, it was something that people could easily understand when you say it's a scope you know, they have um, a lot of experience probably with endoscopy and, and other, you know, um, visual type of products. So it was an easier kind of conversation than um, some of the implants I had done or, or previous femtech products. I think femtech became a buzzword as well in about 2017. Um, and we're starting to see more and more innovation. I'm thrilled to see that. I think the other thing, and um, we've talked about this, you know, I really, when I talk with people, I say, you know, People think about development of a product and um, launch at, and the regulatory aspects is the hardest thing, but there are really three R's. There's regulatory, there's reimbursement, and then there's revenue. Um, and so I think for us, we were at advantage because um, the regulatory pathway was relatively straightforward. Although we did go for hysteroscopy and cystoscopy at the same time. Um, and our reimbursement codes were great. So we already knew mm. how we were gonna get paid and who was gonna do the paying. Um, so those were in a, a really pretty straightforward manner for us, um, which was different than I think a lot of other startups. Maybe they're they're having to create their own code, so it's a little different. Um, I think um, so. We had a lot of advantages in terms of market and environment, and people were tired of paying a lot of money, um, you know, to get these procedures done in the OR. Uh, when COVID hit, we actually, it's an advantage for us because most of these procedures are not allowed to be done right now in the hospital because they don't have bandwidth. And so um, doctors um, really want that, the ability to access um, care for their patients. And so um, in some ways, COVID has been very beneficial for, for office procedures. Um, but from a disadvantage, you know, people ask me all the time, uh, you know, is it hard to raise money as a woman? You know, is it different to rate to be a woman um, in, in, in this in this world? And I guess I just don't really think about it that way. I think more about the fact that you are talking about a product that can be concerning to some people. Um, but I've never felt like there's a disadvantage of being um, a woman. Um, I'm only five feet tall, so that's usually a bigger disadvantage to me than uh, being female. Is just sometimes when I when I present, I can't reach above the podium. Um, but uh, you know, I, I try to to tell other female founders, um, your biggest barrier is yourself. Um, so if you have confidence in who you are and in your team, if you have confidence in your in your product line, 
um, and you have the good support system around you. I don't, I don't think it's that difficult, um, but you've got to know what investors are looking for and how are they going to make their money back? So it's well, a pretty simple equation, harder to do, but a simple equation. That's, I think that's, that's huge. And, um, whether whether stature factors in or not, you have certainly been very successful at projecting the uh, the intentions of your company, fundraising, developing the product, getting it manufactured, getting uh, getting it five ten k cleared uh, by the FDA onto the market. What I think is very interesting what you said a minute ago, and we'll come back to your three R's uh, in a little bit, maybe in a more general sense. But um, I've, I've seen a lot of people who end up in a space and there's some some way things are done in that space mm -hmm. and they they think to innovate in the space and then they, they discover that their innovation isn't reimbursable it, yeah. it jumps too far out because of some differences and oh they're cool differences but now i've just placed myself in a, in a place where i can't get it paid for um or they uh could it's so different they could never really get adoption because of usability. So reimbursement and usability become these huge, huge, huge issues. Tell us a little bit more about how you recognized the niche where you were gonna be able to address the usability concerns and make them in fact better, address the reimbursement because it, it fits into a category, but still find a niche where people where you can meet a felt need that that is some amazing navigation because usually yeah. people innovate so much that they blow themselves out of the reimbursement or usability waters mm -hmm. how, how did you triangulate into that solution yeah i i um well you know i've got experience in this world and had worked in hysteroscopy and in the office before um i think you know the novelty of, of what we were trying to do was um, the hard part, which was market transition. You're moving from the OR to the office. So the way that someone does hysteroscopy, we were really trying to stay in that lane and not change the, the clinical utility. So a scope is a scope is a scope kind of thing. This is how they use a scope. This is how they you know employ it. This is how they would use it for the patient and stay in that kind of as our guardrails. But everything else was up for grabs in terms of shrinking the system, making everything very small, making the cost the right factor. Um, because what really was the barrier is um, getting physicians to be able to afford the equipment for their office. And then mm -hmm. having something that's easy for their staff and um, their technicians, or if they don't have technicians, you know, really for their nurses and for themselves to be able to self serve. Um, so, no. Um, contracts, no service contracts, nothing that you have to service, no pieces, parts that you have to take apart to clean or reprocess. Um, and, um, and then you know kind of what your disease codes are, what your CPT codes are, what your ICD-10 codes are. And we weren't trying to create chaos or that kind of differentiation. Um, we really wanted just to build a better mousetrap. Um, and I think sometimes when people think about innovation, innovation comes in a lot of shapes and sizes, mm. um, but innovation in, in healthcare, especially has always been around economics. Can you do it faster, better, or cheaper? Um, and in our case, we felt like we were able to give them high quality OR visualization, but at a much lower cost and much easier for them to use. So that, you know, that was really what we were striving for the whole time. So in a sense, you really democratized a procedure that in some ways already existed. So the yeah. codes were there, the procedure was there, the familiarity was there. You made it easier and cheaper and more accessible. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that, and that's, that's, that's huge because it's, it's often hard to find those areas. So kudos to you and your team for being able to identify and then execute on that. Uh, sure. on that. Uh, so it's quite a navigation right there. Um, how do you go about commercializing a product like this? Um, and we didn't actually start with my usual question, but I'd asked it to you earlier about, about passion. You know, what is your passion? I remember when we chatted before, you said it had to do with changing how, when, and how you deliver, uh, you could say it better than I could, but how you deliver uh, health care, uh, providing access to care in different ways. And that's really what you've done with sure. Vision 360. Um, how, how do you go about commercializing a product like this? And this is a point of interest for so many of our listeners because yeah. 
people will get to a point, I've got a prototype, yay, wonderful. Yeah, I've got a 510K, wonderful. Now what? Screeching halt. Like, yeah. what, do I, what do I do next? And yeah. you've been thinking about this, you've been in the industry, you really targeted this, you know the players. It does put you an advantage, but if you take one step back and, and the startup comes to you saying, and you are a mentor, so I, I know you get this a lot, says, how do you go about commercializing a product? How, how do you go about setting it up for where you are now? What should they be thinking uh, and about? I, and I think um, it's, a, it's a really hard question for people. Um, and you always, you know, it, if you think with the end in mind, so for us, it's um, we, we would love to have the company acquired by a bigger company that can um, really do more with it. And um, we're very fortunate because we are in a strategic partnership with Olympus right now. So um they you know they have the same mindset um, manisha is the general manager of the dying group and she has the same mindset that i do which is that women um, deserve better care and it doesn't have to be in the hospital and it doesn't have to be expensive mm -hmm. um and so you know you start with that kind of end in mind and then you work backwards but we've been through three different models before we got here from the commercialization and um I, it was very humbling gene because um I, I feel like I've had really good success in the past in commercialization. And it's been the hardest thing is um, as a little company, nobody knows you, nobody knows your people. Um, they don't know your product. They don't know if you're some fly by night company that's gonna go bankrupt tomorrow. And so, you know, even initial sales were really hard. We looked at um, hiring our own distributors. We've looked at hiring our own sales team we worked on 1099s we you know we did a lot of different things um to try to reach the end user um and so i think what's hard for little companies is you know what, what's your call point um does the world need another sales force you know is there another way that you can tackle using a sales force that already exists um, with reputable people um, I think that honestly, for especially for a company that's a one product com company, and if it's not something that you're having to really go in and teach people how to use, mm. um, it's easier just to, if you can find someone that's already in that market space is to join forces. Um, because uh, unless you have a whole, whole portfolio of things to offer people, it's very hard to get their attention. Um, I also think in the world of med tech, you know, the world has certainly changed quite a bit. Um, no longer is it about I hire 30 people and they go out and, you know, the sales reps come the streets and they just hit it hard and, and they make lots of money and everybody's happy. There's a lot more uh, brand awareness and marketing. And um, we did quite a bit with around lead generation and um, analytics and really looking to see how do you target and find people who are ready to purchase your product. So there's a lot of skill and science now um, on the marketing and sales side that I think um, people miss. Um, and when I talk to, to, to um, founders, and usually they're scientists and, and commercial is just not, but they don't know anything about marketing and sales. And that's okay. I mean, that's why we have teams. Um, but you have to get them to understand the only way investors make their money is for you to get to revenue. And so you've got to be able to articulate what that revenue journey looks like. And it's okay if you make mistakes. My uh, investors have been really um, uh, very supportive of our journey and the changes that we've made. And we've pivoted fast. I mean, it was like six months and this is not working. So we're going to try something else. And you, you've got to be able to... Uh, innovate not only on your product but also you know in a commercial perspective yeah that's huge kind of now, you're, you're, on there, but hopefully that answers your question yeah no i think i think that's that's important and you talked about the olympus partnership which i'd like to ask you in a second uh, as much as you can say about how, how does one ever arrange something like that because it's yeah. mystifying for a lot of startups um your your uh, product is for use outpatient as well as as well as in. So, have you encountered group purchasing organizations inside of the hospital systems? Has that been a thing in your? Yeah, I, I mean, we we have not attacked or tackled the GPOs um, because we are focused on what's considered non-facility. So, mm -hmm. not we're not even in ASCs. We really are in the offices, the private you know clinic 
like when you go to the doctor, that's where you're going. This is where these, this care is being delivered. Um, and so, you know, we don't have the, the traditional GPS, but more and more you're having um, super groups, you can call them super groups or, or co-ops where it's groups of offices that get together and they, they are a purchasing entity. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually have contracts with, with a couple of them. And um, the way that we went about that was getting buy-in from a couple of key um, physicians who felt the need and then, you know, really meeting with their CFO and talking to them about the financial implications of, of what they're doing today and what we can bring to the table that's going to save them money and time, um, how you can treat more patients with our device. Um, so we can see seven to eight patients in one day with our, mm. our device versus the traditional two to three that you would have with the tower system. So, um, you know, significant economic differences there. But the That's way so that is, powerful it, to have had those that yeah. input up front and to know yeah. those things going into that development. And it's just a con, you know, and then you have to work the contract. So, um, and working a contract is just like any other contract. Have a good lawyer and um, have good relationships with the people that you're talking to, and and uh, you, you know you've got to create a win-win situation for them. And I know it sounds very cliche, but it's true. Just and just understanding what that win-win means. It's it's in very practical terms. You're talking about things like the cycle time. You're talking about things like the cost. You're talking about things like the training and and what it takes infrastructure-wise to use it. And you simply have identified not simply, but you've identified all those things, and now you're presenting them up for the uh, for the client, which I think exactly. is which is amazing. Well, I want to ask you this, Allison. Let's take this, uh, and we, we do have some specific questions coming in from the audience. I'm going to save okay. those to the end, and then we'll then we'll have uh, folks come on and ask you those questions. But um, and, and by the way, just a, just a thing, put your hand up in Zoom if you'd like to ask Allison a question. We've got uh, some coming in. Um, regulatory reimbursement revenue, your three R's that you mentioned earlier. Let's take this out to uh, your days as a mentor. And you spend a lot of time mentoring, you're on boards. Um, if I come to you as a startup, Explain these three R's to me from a generic standpoint. Okay, we're stepping away from you, Vision specifically. I've got a med tech company. I've got a med tech startup, and I might be at the academic level, and I've got some ideas, and I've got a little bit of clinical data. Uh, maybe not aligned to FDA yet, but I've got some clinical data. Or uh, maybe I'm an independent inventor, and I've been thinking about this. Explain your three R's to me. So, and actually it applies to anything in life science, really. So I, um, I work in, in biologics as well as pharma. Um, and I think, um, and it applies to wearables now. I think that's one of the interesting things is when you talk to people in that digital world, they sometimes forget the FDA applies to them. Um, but very simply, when you look at it, um, uh, you know, there's a kind of your roadmap and you've got your product, you've got your widget, you've got whatever this thing is. Um, and you've got to figure out um, um, who is going to pay, when are they going to pay, and how do you get paid? And that's really three different questions. Um, so in the first part, the regulatory pathway, you've got to understand how you even get to be paid, mm. um, meaning you've got to have something that the FDA is saying that you can sell. So when you get FDA clearance, that means you can go to market and you can sell your product. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to be able to sell it. Um, uh, and so then you have to figure out reimbursement. Okay, so the first R is regulatory. The second one is, is reimbursement. So is there a code, whether you know, you're in the United States or you're um, overseas, so if, do, you have, do you have 510K or do you have CE mark? And then is there a code that says, okay, here's your disease state and we um, have these RVUs and we will pay you this. Okay, so do you have that? That's, that's the reimbursement piece of that. That's the payer saying, we will pay you. Um, and then thirdly is the revenue. So we will pay you, but how do you get paid? Meaning um, who is going to take your product out to the market so that's your sales team, or maybe you sell it online, or you sell it through the hospital, or you sell it through labs, or what is your channel, we call it channel, um, to get to the end user who is going to purchase your product. And so that's really, when I talk to people, I said, you have to think through all of those things and, 
every decision you make from things like, okay, my end user is home health. Okay, well then your regulatory pathway better have a home health connection to it because mm. the regulatory and your reimbursement can alter if your OR versus office versus home health and it's and and your testing is changing. Um, if it's a consumer use product, you've got to do consumer studies, not just regular human factors, but you've got to do consumer studies to say that a consumer can use this. And that's very different than nurses and doctors. So, you know, I mean, in a nutshell, that's I walk people through that. And you've got to think of all three of those all the way at the beginning of your design. And you should be talking to people about that all the way at the beginning. There's something exceptionally simplifying about the way you just expressed that. We will often tell people that FDA is not primarily a technology regulation organization. They are primarily a marketing regulation organization. You've taken that one step further that am I allowed to be paid for this? Yes. Am, that, that's what FDA is there. Are you allowed to be paid for this thing? And if they say yes, then the answer is yes, if you have your claim structure right. And if they say no, the answer is no. Yeah, and I didn't and even talk about how you market it, right? So yeah. I'm saying the right things about my product so I don't get in trouble with the FDA or the FTC or the SEC. So, I mean, you know, there's a lot of acronyms out there that you have to worry about as a startup. All of which uh, regulate marketing uh, claims yeah. of things. So yeah. just rerun this through the answer. Regulatory reimbursement and revenue is the question of, am I allowed to be paid? Mm -hmm. And could I be paid? Correct. And then am I being paid? How, how do I get paid? How do I get yeah. paid? And that's yeah. the sales. Uh, very end of revenue. Sales how do I create end. revenue? Yeah, yeah that's, that, is, that is huge. I love that. We're going to start using that with, uh, with folks. for the day. Yeah, thank you. We're going to give a hat tip by Allison London Brown. Um, <laughs> let's see. We've got one folk uh, here who'd like to connect with you afterwards. We'll make a connection uh, uh, afterwards. Um, but uh, we, we do have a question from our friend Olaf. I'm going to bring Olaf live here if he'd like to okay. join us. Hey, Olaf. Yeah, hi, Allison. Congratulations to your work, your, your, your development. Thank you. Being able to, like, I mean, especially nowadays also, allowing, I guess, higher capacity in medical practices and hospitals with a, with a product like this. Sure. Um, so I'm coming from a consumer products background, like, okay. you know, absorbent products, wipes or so, where like between developing and testing stuff in the lab um, and then, you know, finding out how good or receptive it would be uh, once it would go on sale. And in most cases, there wouldn't be any, you know, uh, any FDA or, or, you know, a Department of Agriculture approval needed for this. Um, but then there's the consumer testing in the middle, right, where we really need to find out is like, you know, how, what are the people using this or buying this product really thinking about it? Mm -hmm. Would they really buy it? Because obviously you want you know, the, the, them to find it useful, helpful. So how does that look? with medical technology, like like the example that uh, you've developed there. I mean, do you recruit doctors or ask doctors, can you just please try it and then give me feedback or you just? Yeah, um, it, it, so different people have different ways of doing this. Um, I came actually from a consumer background as well, um, but consumer healthcare. And so um, I always believe in testing early and often um, even if it's small scale, so um, traditional concept testing and pricing elasticity testing at the very beginning. So, you know, I think Gene and, and his team and we had sketches and we would just talk to doctors about, okay, here's this device. What do you, what do you think about this? And tell me about what, are you, it's really about the pain points. What are you not getting today that you want? Um, and um, tell me about your, your, the way that you practice today. Can I observe you? Can I watch how you're doing procedures? Um, in our case, we already knew there was a gap in the market. We knew that the systems were expensive or um, time consuming or um, people had difficulty basically getting access. And so we already knew there was an economic play. And then it became a question of how do you design something that's cost effective and small? Um, mm -hmm. So it was a little bit, you know, the idea was already there in concept, but I do think in medical, in the medical world, it's very similar to the consumer world. Um, you, you to concept testing, then you have a prototype, you may do advisory boards. Um, once you have something that's um, really workable, then you're doing um, 
testing with models and not people, but um, like we use red bell peppers was one of the, the ways that you test for oh, yeah. the uterus. So you got to have a test model um, and you're testing human factors, you're testing usability, you're testing all of those different um, items um, along the way. Uh, and so I did major market research, quantitative market research. I did qualitative market research. I did one-on-ones, yeah. um, very similar. Um, to, to kind of test uh, early and often. And then before it then was tested with people directly, I guess you could ask a family yeah, you don't do that until you get to the doctor. Episode. Yeah, you, you can't really try it on people yet. Right. So. so for that, you then require the, the FDA um, certification. Sure. Okay. And that does depend on the type of device that you are. Yeah. Um, you know, right. You're class one, you can do right. different things, but... Um, yeah. Or you can go to the FDA and propose that you want to do um, clinical testing. In our case, we didn't have to do clinical testing. I, okay, cool. Thank you, Alison. That's very, uh, very clear. Very good answer. Thank you. I mean, very helpful. <laughs> Thanks, Olaf. Thanks for the question. We appreciate it. That's great. If you have got a question for Alison, um, please feel free to raise your hand in the uh, in the chat here. Uh, Ken Spencer, you are live with us. Yes, Allison, thank you very much. Uh, great presentation. So in getting a device or let's say even a uh, analytic or something into the hospital, how have you navigated going direct or ACOs or I and these? I mean, I mean, there's all the IDNs. I mean, there's all these sort of buying things in between uh, the hospital actually getting these things. Yeah, so, um, so in our case, we're going directly to the office. So we don't have some of those organizations that um, are uh, required to go through. Uh, but traditionally, if you have a new device that is um, going to be in use in the hospital, so like I used to work on implants. So these are things that are actually going in people's bodies and staying there for quite a while, right? Um, and in that case, you um, are getting your clinical work done. And in parallel to that, you should be working with what's called a VAC committee. So the value analysis committee in a hospital, um, along with speaking with the payers and the ACOs. Um, I will say that there are some very good consultants out there and um, uh, groups that can help navigate what that world looks like um, and can put together strategies and programs for small companies. Um, I always tell people, you, if you think development and regulatory is expensive, wait till you try to get to reimbursement because you will spend money there. I mean, you really will. Um, and so reimbursement and getting into the hospital um, really needs to be done kind of in parallel as you're talking with the FDA, I, I believe. Um, you can cut, cut some time that way. Um, but it does start with relationships. It starts with having maybe medical advisors that are willing to take on a VAC because you have to have a champion. Um, I think, uh, you know, dealing with ACOs is a little bit different than that. Um, typically, you're going to want to have um, commitment by a hospital group already. And an IDN is um, really, you know, it's just a, this, it's this network of payer and on the hospital. And so you're, again, you're going to the committees. Um, now, I think the challenge also is that contracts come up every two to three years um, in, those, in those worlds, whether it's a GPO or it's an IDN. So you need to know when, when the contract is coming due. And again, there are some great people, just like grant writers. There are consultants for everything in this world, as you can imagine. Um, but there are some really, really smart people, um, certainly smarter than me, that can can navigate all of that and uh, work through that with you. Yeah. Hopefully, that helps you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ken. Appreciate the appreciate the question. Wonderful. Well, Allison, this has been such an absolute pleasure, and I'm so proud of what you guys have done there and and the ways that you're expanding the product and doing so many cool things with it. So we're just so glad you could join us. Any any last words or last advice? So much of our audience is engaged in the world of med tech and any last parting words of wisdom? Yeah, I think um, two things I would say. Number one is, um, you know, I would really always encourage people to uh, really look at what's going on in the marketplace and um, don't be fearful of trying to do something new. Um, and new can be, again, 
just something that costs less money. It's always, that's always new and refreshing. Um, or it could be something that's smaller. Um, but, you know, get out there and explore what the possibilities are and don't be afraid to do so. Um, that's the first thing. And then the second thing is um, when you are successful and when you are working, you need to make sure that you are working and, and paying it forward. You know, find those people who are looking for your help um, and make sure that they um, can achieve just like you can and that they um, help them from um, making the mistakes that you've made along the way. So I, I do believe that paying it forward is really important, especially in the medical device world. Well, thank you, Allison, for paying it forward today to all of our listeners and to everyone who will, will hear this session. We really, really appreciate your words of wisdom and wish you every success. Thanks so much. Thanks Y'all have a us. great day and uh, come visit us in Raleigh sometime. <laughs> it looks nice down there. Yeah. Thanks, Allison. Bye. Hey, Allison London Brown, U Vision 360. What a, what a great uh, founder and a great company. Uh, cool things that they're doing. My next guest is with us today, Brent Nowak, who is the founder and director of the Advanced Medical Device Institute at Grand Valley State University. Brent, are you with us? I am. It's good it's to see you, Gene. Great to see you. Thank you for being with us. We're so glad you're here. And um, I got to say, a, a, a amazing uh, group and facility that you guys ha have there on the west side of Michigan. I know our team has, has uh, even collaborated with you guys at points, and you've got some amazing uh, 3D printing capabilities and other stuff over there. But um, I'm going to not make the mistake I made with our last guest. I'm going to ask you, Brent, what is your passion before we talk about AMDI? Well, the, uh, I've been in uh, technology development now for, geez, over 25 years. And uh, what it really comes down to is solving the difficult problems, uh, you know, multidisciplinary challenges that are novel that might take a little bit of additional uh, intellectual power or advanced computational tools. Um, but really, the core of that goes to um, this whole med tech industry. I just love the fact that we're trying to change the world and make it a better place for people. There's a real uh, passion around that as well. Very cool. That's very cool. Well, we'd love to know more about AMDI. This is something that you have that you conceived and established with uh, Grand Valley State University. Um, you blew my socks off when you said that you guys were a um, non-instructional unit that has no base funding from the university. So this is a mm -hmm. this is this is most people don't start divisions and say, well, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll pay for it myself. <laughs> That's an amazing <laughs> an amazing thing. Um, I know you do have a presentation. Would this be an appropriate time to bring that up and let you walk us through what AMDI is and what you offer? Uh, maybe after I answer your question, then we'll, yeah. we'll pull that up. How's that sound? Uh, to say that AMDI had, has not received any funding from uh, GVSU or others is not exactly right. When we first started, we did get an investment from the university. Um, I was um, an associate professor at the university and transitioned over to the administrative side of the university where they then needed to cover, you know, my salary and a few of our staff initially, but that um, after three years. So in the last two years, we've been financially sustainable running in the black. So yes, now we are not funded by the university. So uh, many thanks to GBSU for kickstarting that. Wonderful. That's exactly right. They're very, you know, that's the nice thing. Now, um, it's the ACE, the small A in AMDI stands for Applied Medical Device Institute. A lot of people think it is advanced, like you said, Gene. That's okay, but we're a perfect fit for GVSU because the university is a very hands-on applied kind of university and all their project-based courses. But now might be a good time to pull up that slide and I'll, I'll tell the story of AMDI a little bit, how we fit into the community because it's not just being part of the uh, university, but actually in the whole ecosystem. Uh, here in West Michigan, but actually all the way across the state. Let's bring that up. <clears throat> so here go ahead for you. If you can just tell me when the uh, slide should yeah. advance. Go ahead and advance the slide. So the way the model of AMDI is that we fit in this gap that resides between industry and academia, between healthcare providers and the community as a whole. So that's what those four icons represent around uh, AMDI being in the middle, which is part of GVSU. So if you... Um, go to the next slide, you'll just see in our short five years, some of the organizations that we have, we're working with or have worked with in the upper right hand corner, a number of healthcare providers across the state and outside the state, which is amazing. Um, 
and, you know, and that includes nurses and staff. It's, it includes some research organizations that we're doing some clinical trials with, of course, physicians, physicians as well, and clinicians. In the lower right-hand corner, when I say community, we're talking about the city, uh, the state, uh, other med tech kind of uh, healthcare institutions across the state like MishBio. Um, we're part of MBIA, which is an incubator association. We've also have uh, some collaborative research and development agreements um, in at Fort Sam Houston at the US Army Institute of Surgical Research. So the community just doesn't mean our neighbors, but actually means all the way across uh, the nation. And then the lower left-hand corner are some of the companies we're working with. Some of those are clients, some of those are uh, collaborators, and some of them are actually part of what we call a public-private partnership I'll talk about in a minute. And then in the upper left-hand corner are the universities that we're working with. Um, uh, Michigan State, we're actually writing a big proposal right now with some a team over there in the animal science field as well, which is a precursor, of, as you know, to in the med health space to the human medicine side. So uh, next slide, Gene. So that's who we are and that's how we operate. Um, the, our location within the university allows us to tap the intellectual power at GVSU. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but the faculty in engineering and computing sciences, um, many of us have 10 years or more of experience in industry before they came back into the academic uh, world. And so um, here's an example of a, a, a project that was, uh, came to AMDI that we were able to tap some of the intellectual power. And then we, we uh, um, hire graduate students and uh, the faculty, faculty are also participating in this. They're, they're getting funded, um, which they, and this is not a class project. Uh, the unique thing about AMDI is that our, we have five full-time staff and three of us have over 25 years experience in industry and growing uh, small companies uh, like Allison's that we just saw a startup there. In this particular company, they um, were, are looking at uh, very uh, vigorously at monitoring bone healing um, from the surface of the skin without the use of x-rays. And so AMDI got involved with developing uh, some artificial intelligence algorithms for them. We tapped some faculty for that and graduate students. We wrote uh, some machine learning algorithms and have gone through three revisions of that software. So that's one example of, of what AMBI does. And there's three boxes there. There's the development phase, the vetting phase, I call it. And that's where we answer two fundamental questions. Is it technically feasible? And is it a viable business? Now, when you ask it the question if it's technically feasible, you know, we're trying to see if it answers the first laws of physics. You know, and then is it manufacturable? Are the materials available, et cetera? And the second question, which Allison covered with, with great clarity, the three R's, you know, the revenue, reimbursables, and the regulatory, you know, it, many people that come to us, it's very interesting, um, they're inventors. And I, there's, I, instead of three R's, I use two I's. You know, there's the invention, and then there's the innovation, and they're vastly different. To be an innovation, you have to be able to commercialize it, and you have to take into consideration all those three R's, which, thank you, Allison, we'll be using that at AMDI as well. So... <laughs> Uh, the, here's the another... ideas spread, don't they? <laughs> What's that? The ideas spread, don't they? Yeah, they do. They do. They're good, useful tools because um, AMDI focuses, our niche, like I said earlier, are the multidisciplinary problems that are very technically challenging. You might, uh, and you want to go to the next slide real quickly. And this is the example is that you might need somebody that knows something in computational fluid dynamics. And that's this case right here. We had an, uh, a company called Surge Cardiovascular. And they came to us and they wanted to develop a new cannula tip for heart bypass surgery. So a cannula, for those who are on that don't know what it is, it's basically a tube that crosses the body uh, barriers for, it could be uh, to provide medicine, it could be a drain tube. But in this case, the cannula is a tube that goes in the aortic arch, you see in the upper left-hand corner there. And, and I mean the far, furthest left slide, um, and it pumps the blood through while they're doing open heart surgery. Uh, this company, Surge Cardiovascular, here is a West Michigan company. They're, uh, they're an OEM. They develop their own products. And they wanted this cannula tip to, to produce less turbulence and lower sidewall pressure on the aortic arch. Basically, mimic, better mimic the, 
natural heart flow. So they came to us and they said, do you have anybody that can help us with that? And I said, well, we've got a faculty member who does computational fluid dynamics. And by the way, he did his postdoc in hematology. And so over a 12 month period and three graduate students and this faculty member, they worked side by side with an industry partner. And they did the computational fluid dynamic simulation you see here. So that's another example of the kind of products we, this is an idea where like Allison was saying, this person uh, in this company is very familiar with the field. So they're, they better understood the three R's. And uh, uh, the benefit is that, you know, the students are working in, and this is not a senior design project. I wanna make sure that's clear to everybody as well. AMDI with our uh, professional staff that work full time with our clients, we move at the pace of industry. And we brought our hundred plus years of experience, combined experience that have policies and procedures and forms so that you can um, you know, manage this at the pace of industry. So that's kind of a long answer there, uh, Gene. No, that's, that's great. I'll say, do you want to go to the next slide in the, uh, in the deck here? Real, certainly, but real quickly, before I do, um, this particular company, they, we did the analysis for them and, the, and uh, they started preparing the patents. And several years later, they're coming back to us and we're gonna be doing the prototyping uh, and testing for the validation, which we'll talk about that when we talk about the added manufacturing next. But let's go to the next one. And the third slide, I don't know if, if this is an animation or not, go ahead and hit it again. Um, this is what I call a bad view. <laughs> you never want to be looking up uh, and seeing a doctor looking. And this is a PCI procedure, uh, percutaneous intervention. Uh, this is a case where you might be having a blockage in your heart and the doctor needs to snake a, a tube up one of your arteries and, and uh, open up that through a angioplasty or a, uh, possibly put a stent in there. Um, in the lower hand corner is a company called Corindus Cardiovascular out of the East Coast. And this gets back to the reach of how we serve the community. At the time we were working, we're, we are still working with Spectrum Health Innovation, which is a local uh, hospital here in West Michigan. Uh, Dr. Ryan Mater is an interventional cardiologist. Uh, he's a giant in the field. Um, and he, at the time, had done more robotic PCI procedures using the Corindus cardiovascular robot you see right there. Interestingly enough, why would you need a robot in the surgical suite? Well, because that Philips C arm you see in the back right there is um, irradiating the patient. Mm -hmm. So you got the surgical team there, uh, a couple of nurses in the interventurologist, and they're getting irradiated as well. And there are some case studies around, you know, um, some of these surgical teams, if they develop cancer, uh, it tends to be on the left side of their body because they're standing next to that x-ray arm. Now, um, so the whole idea is they wanna get the surgical team out of the room, out of, out of the area of the x-rays, because this is a cumulative problem. Um, I can't remember what the term is right now, but it's a, it's a study where you accumulate so much x-ray and it finally causes some, um, irregular growth in the body that we better know as cancer. Well, so Ryan Mater had at the time had done more um, remote, uh, had done more robotic surgeries than anybody else using a Corindus robot. And he came to AMDI and he said, hey Brent, you know, we'd like to do this remotely. We wanna do this when there's a snowstorm in Ludington. In <laughs> Ludington, Michigan, if those of you who are not from Michigan, it's on the west coast of Michigan, off of Lake Michigan. And when the snow blows in that, Canadian wind blows in and you get the humidity off the lake, you dump a lot of snow. So you don't, in that golden hour, you can't get somebody to uh, a hospital that can do this kind of procedure. So the idea is you put this surgical arm in a remote robot and you have a world-class internationally recognized interventional cardiologist like Ryan Mater doing the procedure on you. So Ryan came to and talked to, and we met a few times. He goes, you know anybody that does anything in robotics? And I said, well, yeah, I had, I did my PhD in robotics at the University of Texas, and we had done some NASA projects on remote robotics. And I said, it's been a few years since I've worked in that field, but let's see what we can do. Well, we put together a three-way uh, investigative research project with Corindus Cardiovascular. And uh, in, in a matter of, well, this is the funny story. It, it took a, a few years for to get through all the legal and regulatory issues between the three organizations, but in six months, Ryan did, I think it was a hundred procedures on live animals, 105 miles away. 
successfully. And he demonstrated that using the Crindus um, product and the, the network we set up, you could do remote surgery successfully. So that gives you a, a broad spectrum of the type of projects we do with our clients. They could be, I love some of these stories. We have a, a, a hairdresser from the east side of the state that we're working with now that came up with a solution that's dealing with dysphagia, uh, dysphagia with a G in it, not an S, that has to do with um, swallowing issues and excess saliva. I've had a stay-at-home dad work with us where uh, he developed a, an app for is uh, for kids to use to learn um, where they earn time on smart devices to get on the web after they answer so many math questions that are age related and class related. And we've dealt with large um, surgical robot companies from the east side of the country that I think they're over by Boston somewhere, Massachusetts. So let's go on to the last thing that I, I know we only have a limited amount of time and I'll cover this quickly. This is the other large um, element of AMDI, if you remember, we try to put together, fill this gap where you need a combination of organizations and institutions that don't normally work side by side. So next, go ahead and advance the slide. We put together a public-private partnership with the state of Michigan and the city of Grand Rapids, and they both deserve a great amount of credit for working with us on this. And in this case, Medisurge, which is an industry partner in Grand Valley State University. So we put together a public-private partnership, and go ahead and advance it again, please. And we have a three-year investigative study on how you can advance medical devices to market more quickly using additive manufacturing. And now this is not, doesn't have to do with prototyping, but we're looking at the scalability of um, additive manufacturing for a production machine and not just for prototyping. So let's go to the next slide and I'll cover this quickly. We can go to some questions. We did the first installation in uh, 2019. That's the lower picture there, the system we have in place. Um, and then the following year, uh, six months, we went through commissioning and training. And now we're at the uh, uh, process of actually doing um, contract manufacturing. Now, MediSurge is ISO 13485 certified. So those of you who don't know, to be a, to be a manufacturer or an FDA um, regulatory pathway, you need to have find an ISO 1345 manufacturer. So go on and go ahead and to the next slide and I'll talk about a couple of case studies real quick. So this is the fundamental question we're trying to answer. In conventional manufacturing in the upper left-hand corner, if you have very few parts to be made, it's going to cost you a lot of money. And if you're a, a small company, a startup, you're trying to prototype and develop, that's where normally everyone thinks about additive manufacturing. Well, I can prototype one or two parts. Well, as you start doing larger volume manufacturing to the far right there, conventional manufacturing costs drop off very quickly. Injection molding, CNC machining, et cetera. This is a very sim overly simplified chart, but in the case of additive manufacturing, without the need to have molds and mold designs, your cost per part doesn't grow is not very high initially and it doesn't necessarily fall off as much as when you get to the volume either. So where's that threshold where you can use additive manufacturing for, for production? So let's do a couple case studies real quick. So here's a case study of a, a client that has a manifold that in the left-hand picture, that manifold comprises seven components where they take these parts or manufactured just like you see it individually. They glue them all together. They have to test the glues and they have uh, these parts coming apart in the field. And this is a medical part of a medical device, by the way. And the total cost in this case um, is uh, $27. Well, we did a direct replacement of that design as one 3D additive part without that didn't need any gluing. So it's functionally equi equivalent. Um, we're using biocompatible materials. And so no, you no longer have the risk of separation. So we dropped the cost only 43 cents to $26.58. But if you design for additive manufacturing, reduce, you reduce the material cost, you have less waste, it still has equivalent performance. It, you know, the reduction in weight is comparable to the reduction in volume materials used, but we're down to $20.28. And this doesn't include the assembly or the inspection that you would have to do or the testing on the one on the far left. So you get a significant reduction in cost in this case. Now, that's a classic study, um, and given the size of the particular part, you could do this on a production scale as well on an, on an additive ma machine. So let's I look just, at I just the got pause you there, Brian. That's a, it's a huge thing. I think a lot of times uh, folks who are who are new to the manufacturing world won't understand 
they say, well, this part is so cheap, like maybe one of those connectors over there. Yeah. But the process of putting it together with the other parts, the process mm -hmm. of testing that, watching for failures and stuff like that, you can't over overemphasize how important this idea that you could reduce these assembly steps is. That's all got to be taken into account. I think a lot of times that gets lost at the early stage innovation uh, level. Absolutely. So I just want to em emphasize that for the audience. No, no, absolutely. That's a great one. And that also goes to this next slide real quickly is that this is a very small um, introducer hub, it's called. And using traditional injection molding, the mold might cost $10,000 to build. Um, doing a study, if you needed 500 of them, you'd have to get about a dollar apart. The lead time just on the parts on, on the manufacturing is four to eight weeks, but that doesn't include also um, the, the lead time just to get the mold. But if you do an additive manufacturing, you see a platform there on the right, that's all of those little couplers lined up on there. So we would, in this case, wouldn't have a mold cost. And this is a real world case study as well, by the way, our parts are $3 apart, but the lead time is only two days. So that's where a lot of people use this in prototyping. But if you wanna do an early introduction of your design and get it in the hands of users, you could design your part in two days. You can get into some early adopters. And then if they have ideas and wanted to change it, you can make those modifications and get those designs out very quickly. So the annual capacity in our machine in our lab is 100,000 parts in a year. So basically, I don't. I know we've only got a couple minutes. Go ahead and hit the advance if you'd like to. Um, there's some case studies on about where's the threshold. In this case, that, that break point is about 5,000 parts. In this case, if you want to go traditional injection molding versus additive manufacturing. But I know we don't have a lot of time. I'd rather. Um, have, leave some time for discussion and questions and answers if there are any. Absolutely. If you have any questions, please feel free to, to raise your hand in the chat. I, I think it's it's so important also to understand that folks will come to us sometimes and they'll say, well, I couldn't possibly go to my 510K with uh, 3D printed parts. And the answer is, well, no, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Or they'll come and they'll say, well, I'm going to go to my 510K with 3D printed parts. And it's like, well, wait, hold on. And this body of work that you guys are doing is trying to put meat around those bones so that it's, it's actually becomes a little bit more obvious. Okay, these kinds of things, we really can say, yeah, this is good enough for, for production and long-term use. Um, I know in talking before, one of the things you had mentioned, Brent, was the idea of um, uh, both sort of biocompatibility and sterility and things that might be left on parts, not in parts, but around the surface of complex parts and actually studying uh, chemical retention on those. Um, we, we do have a question here, but I'm going to just give you a second to talk about what kinds of issues come up that need to be answered by this kind of, of research. Good. Thank you. So you can uh, turn off the slide now if you like. There's sure. really not much more to talk about so we can focus on the question. Um, you know, AMDI uh, fits perfectly in the, in the GVSU and the, the mo model that I described about building a bridge between industry and academia. And to your question, what are some of the kind of questions that need to be answered? <sighs> Using additive manufacturing, the design laws change. So when you're starting to do 3D printing, you have their scalability issues just in the design itself because you can get very much more complex parts. You can get very complex parts. And as you mentioned, Gene, these geometries create situations where you may have some residual polymer on the part, even after it cures. Uh, so we're doing a study in, internally uh, where we're looking at how much residual monomers are left over on some of these complex parts that you can't manufacture in any other way, because that's an issue that the FDA is, is going to want to address. Um, also, from the academic standpoint, um, from the technician level to the engineering level to the, the manufacturing uh, product and design and manufacturing laws, um, I read a study recently that there was 1,000, over 1,800% increase in job postings in additive manufacturing in the last wow. three years. Yeah. So, and those job postings are, and there's a demand for more engineering training courses in additive manufacturing along. You need to understand the materials, you understand the design laws, um, technician level, operators level, exactly everything. So this whole, um, AMDI is part of the economic community in West Michigan, but also all the way across the nation. Like I said, our community is very large. That's what we're trying to address is we have this emerging manufacturing capability that it's literally booming and we're all just learning how to use it. 
So those who are on the, the webinar and listening in, um, this is a very vibrant area and it has a huge impact on the med device, med tech world right now. That's awesome. I'm yeah. going to let our friend Ken Spencer. Ken, you're live with a question for yeah, Brent. Brent. Thanks. A really uh, interesting presentation. Um, in your first uh, example there of additive manufacturing, uh, there the, the resulting part on the right-hand side looked considerably different than the other two. When, and so my question is, did the FDA require you to come back and do any additional work or testing there before you, you were approved to use that final device? That's a great question. And this, in that particular example, those parts don't make contact with the patient in any way. Um, the materials we used and the, the system we selected, we did a one-year study before we uh, got the additive manufacturing system. It's called a carbon 3D system. The carbon 3D system, as Gene mentioned, uh, has pre-approved um, FDA materials for biocompatibility bio and cytotox cytotoxicity. And the fluids that flow through those channels um, would be the only component that, uh, that uh, would contact have any human body fluids or anything of that nature. And since the materials are already pre-approved, um, this that would not necessarily have to be recertified. But again, uh, I want to tell everybody just on the legal side as well as the uh, regulatory side. I'm not a regulatory expert. And this is where we send our clients to people uh, like into being that have more regulatory expertise in that area to study that part. That's a great question, Ken. Ken, great answer there. Um, Can I ask Brent. a follow up? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Ken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So additive manufacturing, I sometimes, I've been a software development guy forever, right? So, so one of the issues we've always had with the FDA is, you know, you change your software and you got to go back through an entire certification thing. So it's, you know, additive manufacturing versus additive, let's say software improvement, you know, is an interesting parallel kind of, kind of thing. And I'm just, you know, wondering uh, if you, you know, had any problems with the FDA on any of your stuff? Uh, no, we have not. Now, this additive system we have is we've only had now that we're entering into our third year. Um, and as uh, uh, again, we're normally very early in the process where we're just taking people's ideas off a napkin sketch and helping them to develop the first prototypes. Uh, to meet what's called a minimum viable product. So we don't necessarily get into these discussions about the regulatory and, um, and the revenue side as much as Allison does or uh, Gene at Into Being would do. So we haven't personally run into any of those, but um, um, I'm sure there's some good stories out there. I can't well, say for sure. And I think from the standpoint of the, the regulatory part of it, which I could speak to, what's very powerful about what you guys are working on there is let's say that you do get through a clearance, right? And you're, you happen to be using additive manufacturing for that clearance and whether the material by itself is considered biocompatible and doesn't require a lot of work or you go through the biological risk assessment and, and whatever testing is required and you get, you get set up and you get your manufacturing set up going. The only thing that would really come of question would be design changes at that point. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be the, uh, the biocompatibility questions at that point, they could stay they could stay the same, but it's a it's a perceptive question on Ken's part. Ken, did that answer your question, or do you have other uh, another question? That's great. Thank you very much. Jim. Good question. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, this is really exciting, Brent. And obviously, we've uh, we've reached out uh, and and been the beneficiary of uh, some of your guys' uh, work over there. That uh, the carbon is a very impressive uh, system, and it's all set up very nicely. And you guys have some great uh, great team over there. This is this is an absolutely selfish uh, question that my team actually asked me the other day, and they said, "We got to remember to ask Brent: do, Can his team in 3D printing on the carbon do thermoplastics or only thermosets?" I'm just gonna have to ask everyone's uh, apology for this. But do you guys do uh, thermosets? Or are they all thermo? Or are they all thermosets, not thermoplastics? Or yeah, are you aware? They're, they're all they're they come in two different kinds. There's either um, single part or two part polymers. Um, but they're all, um, once they're thermoset, they're set. They're all I, I can't remember sets. which the terminology is. Once they're printed, you can't reform them, right? Yeah, you can't, you can't them. grind them down and reuse them again. You reuse the materials, but that's a good question. That's great. Well, I can hardly recommend the uh, work product that comes out of that because we've seen it in our own hands here at Into Being. So we're grateful for that and grateful for you sharing your your wisdom with the uh, community. Like Allison was saying, you got to 
got to know people to talk to people to be able to ask questions and I want y'all to go ask Brent your questions and uh, know that AMBI is out there doing great stuff so Brent thank you for being on with us today welcome thanks for having me it's good seeing everyone take care Gene thanks again And with that, we come to the end of another episode of MedTech Crossroads. I'm so glad you could all join us. If there's any good weather out there, I hope you go out and you use it. And we're looking forward to seeing you next Friday at the same time, 2 p.m. Eastern. Thanks for being here. Bye-bye.